Bishop, uh, good morning. Would you please state your full name for the record? Good morning. Uh, Bishop Michael Hepner, 7th Bishop of Crookston. And you have been the Bishop of Crookston and appointed by the Holy See uh, as the uh, ordinary in Crookston now for 11 years? Correct. And in that 11 years and as Bishop of the Diocese of Crookston, has it been your policy and practice to um, keep secret among yourself and your closest advisors any allegations, reports, or suspicions of sexual abuse by priests that I see? No. Has it been your policy and practice in those 11 years to uh, do what you can as the bishop to protect the priests who have been either accused or suspected of sexual abuse? Uh, no. Have you, in the 11 years as Bishop of the Diocese of Crookston, engaged in uh, an effort to keep confidential, that is, among yourself and your closest advisors, any information that surfaces that is suspicious of sexual abuse of minors by clerics in the diocese? Uh, when asked for confidentiality, I give it some consideration, yes. So, uh, when were you asked for con confidentiality and uh, you kept it confidential because you were asked? Pertinent to this uh, investigation, uh, Mr. Ron Vasek uh, in 2011, in September, uh, came to my office and wanted to tell his story. Uh, I listened to his story. He asked for absolute confidentiality uh, because uh, no one knew of this, his wife did not know of it, his son, his family did not know of it, and he asked uh, that I keep his story confidential. So are there any other instances when you have kept it confidential because you're responding to a request that it be kept confidential? I don't private. recall any right now. This one is the one I'm thinking of. Okay. so. At any time then, while Bishop, have you ever reported any information received by you uh, suspicious of sexual abuse by any of the clerics to any individual outside of your office, that is, outside of your review board? or your closest advisors? Uh, I don't recall myself personally doing that. Uh, I, through my uh, judicial vicar, uh, uh, we would report, for example, credible accusations. Okay, let's, 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 I'm asking you now personally first. Uh, there is a policy um, uh, that was adopted pursuant to the United States Catholic Conference um, uh, uh, bishops in the charter uh, that was implemented in the Diocese of Crookston, was it not? Correct, it is. Okay. So the question now pertains to you as the bishop in the last 11 years. Have you ever shared any information um, in which there was a report or a suspicion of sexual abuse of a minor with anybody outside uh, of the your inner circle, and your inner circle would be your top officials and your review board. I don't recall any. Is the answer no? I don't recall any no. How many times have you received, you personally received information that um, was uh, suggestive of uh, sexual misconduct by a priest of the <coughs> diocese pertaining to a minor? I would say a few. Uh, I don't recall what, a number. Give your, give your best estimate of that number. Uh, maybe three or four. 
And what names would uh, that three or four include, as you recall? Well, I'm thinking of two recently. Uh, one was an anonymous note. There was no name with it. Uh, and I don't recall the other. Uh, the name on it. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, priests that were suspected of having committed or accused uh, of having uh, engaged in sexual uh, misconduct pertaining to a minor. What are the names of the three or four priests to whom you referred? Right, I don't, I don't recall the names. Our diocesan um, policy calls for reports of sexual abuse of minors to be reported to the Vicar General. Is it your testimony then um, that as bishop and the one who has the ultimate decision to place or remove a priest, um, um, by reason of risk of sexual abuse that you have never chosen to protect the priest um, um, at the risk of, of minors? That is correct. I'm going to uh, show you an exhibit, uh, Bishop. Uh, we have been we have marked for identification as Exhibit 40, and you can see that we marked it Exhibit 40, but there's also date stamps or it's been stamped, that means produced by the diocese uh, to us in this litigation under Vasek. And then you'll see the first page is 67. Do you see that stamp number? I do. And then um, this particular exhibit has three pages, uh, 67 through 69. Correct? I see that. And this is a letter addressed to you, is it not, from? Um, one of um, the employees um, of the diocese at Crookston, Jim Clausen. Uh, Mr. Clausen has been an employee up until recently. Yes, he retired. And uh, did you ask him to retire or demote or fire him? No. Is it your testimony that he retired on his own? That's my understanding. Father Folks is the moderator of the Korea, and he hires the Korea folks. Okay. Well, the ultimate hire is your decision to make, and you've delegated that to, to Monsignor Folks? Father Folks does the hiring. Okay. Father, it's Father Folks, not Monsignor? It's Monsignor. Okay. Um, do you remember receiving this Exhibit 40 from uh, Jim Clausen? Yes, I believe I do. Did um, he discuss it with you and advance his concerns as to why he wrote you this exhibit and this letter on October 27, 2014? Yes, I believe so. What did he tell you in advance of you having received this letter about why he was concerned? Well, as, as he explained in the letter, I remember uh, receiving the letter and then sitting and talking with him about it. So as the letter says, he, he was on the, the uh, team that followed up uh, after he came returned from treatment. And 
And he was the, uh, um, at that time, the safe environment um, coordinator, was he not? He was. And that was a position um, in the diocese in which his responsibility was to ultimately answer to you through Monsignor Fultz and to make sure that the diocese and you as bishop were in compliance with the Charter for Protection of Children. Yes, he was, uh, he was Safe Environment Director and so he was responsible for the work that we did in uh, the Safe Environment and in the implementation of the Charter, yes. And in advance of receiving this letter from him dated October 27th, 2014, what did Jim Clausen tell you about why he was so concerned? Or did Jim Clausen tell you before you received this letter that he was concerned about the practice that you were employing in protecting priests who were suspected suspect suspected of sexual abuse? No, I don't remember any conversation, certainly not about protecting priests. I remember sitting with Mr. Clausen and reviewing this letter. So it's your testimony that he never told you that he was concerned about you protecting he priests? He may have, I don't recall. I do remember sitting and talking with him about this letter. Did, do you recall him expressing concerns to you about you keeping uh, suspicions of priests um, who have been accused and may be a risk, a uh, secret? No. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to the third page of this letter. And um, in the In the second to the last paragraph, um, he writes, and look in the middle of it, I know one employee who was terminated for not living a moral life consistent with Catholic teaching. Um, has violated as many as 15 to 20 code of conduct rules. Um, are you aware of having violated code of conduct rules in the diocese pertaining to sexual misconduct? Uh, not since, uh, since he returned from treatment, no, and that's when this was written. What rules have you violated uh, pertaining to, to, to minors prior to treatment? I don't remember any referring to minors. What, what do you remember? I remember um, his visiting, for example, adult bookstores. And no conduct pertaining to suspicions pertaining to minors at all? Uh, no misconduct in that regard. No suspicions? No, uh, of misconduct, no. No suspicions ever brought to your attention? Objection asked and answered. Join. What about inappropriate conduct with minors? Any, any information ever received by you pertaining to inappropriate conduct with minors. Objection is to vague. Not just sexual abuse, but inappropriate conduct with minors. What exactly are you talking about, counsel? So he's aware of what you're asking. Inappropriate, what do you, how do you define that? I'm asking you. Uh, inappropriate, no, I wouldn't say inappropriate. Uh, so what do you remember about the 15 to 20 code of conduct rules that uh, uh, has violated, according to Jim Clausen, the safety uh, coordinator. 
I don't know uh, to what Mr. Carson would be referring. Did you ask him? You'd have to ask him. No, did I, you ask him when you met with him? I don't recall. Did you meet with him after you received this letter? I did. And um, weren't you concerned that he had enumerated 15 to 20 code of conduct uh, violations? I don't recall discussing this specific sentence with him. Weren't you alarmed about? Uh, was doing OK uh, uh, at this moment according to his team and according to uh, his pastor and supervisor. And so I was monitoring that situation. So how were you monitoring that situation? Well, in conversations with his pastor, and uh, it seems to me I spoke uh, for, for a number of months every Monday morning with him on the phone to see how his week was. Well, if he's engaged in inappropriate conduct with minors, how is a phone conversation with him uh, monitoring um, that conduct? Objection misstates the evidence. He never said he was in, involved with inappropriate contact with minors. Join. And I'm just saying, if he were to be, how would monitoring him or doing a phone conversation monitor that kind of conduct? Objection states a hypothetical. You can answer. To my uh, uh, knowledge, there was no uh, that kind of behavior. Well, your knowledge consisted of the conversation with this pastor and, at that point in time, uh, morning phone Monday morning phone conversation with him, correct? Yes, and with the team. When you say the team, to whom are you referring? Uh, to the team that Mr. Clausen's resigning from here with this letter. It's actually Clausen's job to help you make sure safe, isn't it? Uh, he was the safe environment coordinator, yes. And isn't he bringing to you, as you recall the conversation in this letter that you just identified, to you concerns that he is a risk and not safe? This was his opinion, yes, obviously but because of the letter. You overrode his opinion, didn't you? I listened to him. I took what he said into consideration, and I continued to check myself as I mentioned, with others and uh, with, with his supervisor. And uh, you relied on and his denials of any misconduct uh, or inappropriate conduct with minors, didn't you? That was one piece. And then you also relied upon who else in, uh, in disregarding Jim Clausen's concerns? Uh, his pastor who and, is, and the rest of the team. Who is the pastor? Uh, Father Chuck Huck. H-U-K? H-U-C-K, I believe. And what did Chuck Huck tell you? Uh, to the best of my recollection, that uh, he was engaged in ministry and uh, uh, not anything inappropriate. How many times did you discuss the with him? Numerous times. I don't remember a number. How many? I don't know. How often? Objection, asked and answered. I don't remember how many, but fairly regularly, I would say. Well, you said you had Monday phone conversations with Correct. Did you have phone conversations with this pastor, Father Huck? I did. Did you have personal meetings pertaining to progress and or risk um, with uh, Father Huck? I believe I did. How many? I don't remember how many. When? I don't remember how many and when. So you relied upon and I relied upon his pastor, Father Huck, um, and anybody else you relied upon in making the decision disregard uh, the concerns brought to you by the safety uh, uh, coordinator, Jim Clausen? Uh, as I mentioned, I visited, I mean, I relied on his support team with his supervisor, Father Chuck, and with my own contact with uh, when you say the support team, whom are you referring to? The team that uh, Mr. Clausen's referring to here in this letter. Okay. 
So you're disregarding the, the recommendations brought to you by Jim Clausen, who is in charge of the support team, correct? As objection, I mentioned before. Wait a minute. Check, objection argumentative. That's not what he said. That's right. I took into consideration what Mr. Clausen has said in the letter. Um, who is on the support team that you're referring to that Clausen is in charge of? Oh, I remember, I think Lisa uh, Gianetti was Rethel and uh, Father Dave Super, and I don't remember others. Uh, Father Dave Super, he was on the review board, was he not? Um, at times he was. I don't know if Father Folks or Father Baumgartner uh, handled the review board. And you mentioned another name besides him. You, did you say Giovetti? Uh, Rethel is her first name, Gianetti. Can, can you spell that for us? I can't. G-I-O-N-E-T-T-I, -T -T -I, I would think something like that. The first name is? R-E-A-T-H-A-L, I believe, or T-H-E-L, Rethel. Rethel G and Gianetti. Gianetti. And what was her job or role at, that, at this time? She may have been head of the uh, um, stewardship office, I believe, 14. She's been ahead of that office for a number of, of years now. And so when you refer to this support team um, under Jim Clausen, upon whom you're relying uh, Correct. Uh, correction. It wasn't under Jim Clausen. He was part of it. Okay. He was not speaking on behalf of them? No, I, I don't believe so. OK. So he's one member of the support team? I believe so. Is this a appointed support team or an informal team that's been assembled by you and Monsignor Fultz, or what? Um, I, I believe Monsignor Baumgartner was the vicar general. Uh, maybe, maybe Monsignor Fultz. He's in his fourth year. But yes, I put, I, I would, I put that team together after, uh, uh, after care. So a specific to Correct. Okay. Had you done anything like that before? Uh, came back from treatment? Uh, not, I don't recollect. And who else is on this support team that you assembled responsive to that situation? Uh, in addition, I don't remember in addition to the names I've given you. I don't recall who else would have been on that. I don't recall. You did, you did testify that you relied upon the support team, and that would be Father a, a Dave Cooper. Super, S-U-P-E-R. Excuse me. Father Dave Super uh, in uh, disregarding um, the, the concerns of Clausen. What did Dave's no, objection, Mr. Dave's no, testimony? Disregarding. And argumentative. You don't have to answer that question. You did say that you relied upon Father Dave Super um, um, in considering uh, the risk and making the decision that you did pertaining to. What did Dave Super tell you upon which you relied? pertaining to the risk of uh, You used the word decision. I didn't understand what decision you were referring to. You had said you relied upon the team in, 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 in considering what to do with He's in ministry. He's been in ministry, uh, and the team uh, work, is working with him, and um, I relied on them, yes, and they're not telling me uh, that there's a concern or problems. Uh, Jim Clausen, Mr. Clausen, obviously with this letter, had some concerns, but um, uh, I'm not hearing any concerns from other members of the team as continues in good ministry. Well, did you ask them? That was their role, 
to, to continue to journey to walk with him, and if there were concerns, they could contact me. Um, Rito Gianetti has indicated that um, as a member of that support team, she had reported to you concerns about and a 14-year-old. I don't what, recall that. Do you deny ever having received any information from Rethel uh, in which she raised concerns to you about his relationship to a 14-year-old youth? I don't recall that. So did you ask, other than Father other than Jim Clawson as a member of this team, any of the other members of the team about what they knew or what they discerned about fitness to be in ministry um, at the time you received or shortly after you received this letter, Exhibit 40 from Clawson? I don't recall. Should you remember asking Father Super, hey, what about Do you have any concerns? I don't recall. Do you remember asking Rito Gianetti, hey, what about, do you have any concerns? He's back from treatment. Um, uh, is there anything you're concerned about as a member of the support team that I've assembled uh, for you to I don't recall. Of? I don't recall. Okay. So you do recall asking, do you not, if he had engaged in any inappropriate conduct with minors? Or did you? Uh, when, when he's in ministry after treatment, I visited with him on Mondays uh, and asked him how it's going, I imagine. And that's what I remember. Well, at any time, did you ask, have you, do you have any re in relationships with um, minors uh, present or in the past that could be considered inappropriate. Did you ever ask him that question at any time while continuing him in ministry? After treatment, uh, not to my recollection, I don't know. Did you ask him before treatment? I may have. Um, I may have. Uh, Do you remember? I may have. I don't remember any specific conversation. Bishop, isn't that something you want to know? Isn't that a question? The first question when you have a potential risk, don't you want to know what the priest tells you about whether he has an inappropriate relationship or has had an inappropriate relationship? Isn't that the first question you'd want to ask him when considering whether he is a risk? I don't know if it's the first question. I uh, would guess that I asked uh, about his boundaries and about his relationships uh, and the propriety of them. Yes, I would think. Well, wait, I don't remember say, any specific conversation about that. You said I would guess and I would think. My question to you is this. Do you remember asking at any time uh, if he had had any inappropriate relationships with any youth while a priest of the diocese? I don't remember any specific conversation. Let's go back to Exhibit 40, and at that same paragraph, uh, the next sentence after has violated as many uh, uh, as 15 to 20 code conduct rules, uh, period, he writes, 
I understand that you need to protect your fellow priests, but in this case, I feel as though you have put this priest above protecting the rest of the priests and the people of the Diocese of Clifton. Did I read that? What he wrote correctly? That's what I read. Did you read that when he wrote it? I imagine I read it, yes. I think when he sent me the letter, I read it. And um, what say you to his allegation to you that you have put uh, and protecting him above um, the people of the Diocese of Crookston? He's mistaken. What leads you to believe he's mistaken? Because I didn't do that. You continue in ministry. Correct. And he is in ministry today. Correct. Well, no, he's retired. Well, he was until he retired. Correct. <laughs> and he retired because of health reasons. That's correct. And it's not because you were, did you ever restrict his ministry? No. Did you ever put him on monitoring? Yes. Uh, beyond what you told us? Uh, what I've told you, I believe that's what I remember. And did you ever restrict him from having any contact with you? No, not to my recollection. Uh, in this same uh, letter, the next sentence, uh, Jim Clausen writes, has now had three chances to get it right and in my opinion is failing at this one. What is your response to his assertion? He's here? mistaken. Did you explain to him why you thought he was mistaken? My recollection of the conversation is that uh, uh, I listened to him and uh, I told him he was mistaken. That's what, what I remember. The next sentence says, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Do you agree with that assertion? I don't know. Do you disagree with that? Uh, I disagree a little bit with the word best predictor, maybe one of the predictors. Would you agree with the statement then that past behavior is a good predictor of future behavior? I would say past behavior is a predictor. Uh, past behavior may be a predictor. You know, people can change. Did you believe that changed? I, I, what I saw, it was that he was doing good ministry uh, and avoiding what he needed to avoid, and he was doing good ministry, and the people appreciated it. Mm -hmm. He goes on to write in the next sentence, I am strongly urging you to reconsider your decision to keep in ministry. Did you reconsider that? Uh, I listened to what he had to say, and I kept in ministry. So you didn't reconsider it? I listened to what he had to say, and I continued to have ministry. He goes on to write, I can't in good conscience continue to pretend like this might work. It is for that reason and my own personal integrity that I need to go on record that should be removed from ministry. What was your response to Jim Clausen's assertion here? I don't know my particular response, but it obviously was working and uh, Obviously, I did not remove him from ministry. 
Well, it's obvious you didn't remove him from ministry, but it's not obvious it was working. Mm -hmm. Why do you say it's obvious it was working? Because he was doing good work and the people appreciated it. Well, let's look at the exhibit to see what kind of work he had been doing mm -hmm. in the past and uh, what the safety uh, environment coordinator thought about it. In the same exhibit, um, at the first paragraph, F, he says, Dear Bishop, by now you probably have been told I removed myself from the care team I would like to explain my decision. So that was a pretty radical thing he had done, right? He removed himself from the team. And then he writes, referring to the history, um, from one day, from day one, when we interviewed the first couple, I told Father David that this would not end well um, that first couple was raising concerns about a 13 or 14 year old youth, wasn't it? I don't recall. He went on to write, I also told him that most of our present litigation was for allegations that happened quite some time ago before our time. I said, this one is on us. Do you remember reading that? I, I read it, I'm sure. And um, did you understand that he resigned from the care team because of the way you were handling and others before him? He resigned uh, with this letter, or explaining in this letter, because of the way uh, I was handling He goes on to write, we have to do the right thing and do it soon. He acted quickly and did the right thing for the diocese and for About a week or so later, the initial assessment came in from St. John Vianney Center, period. It was determined that he was at a high risk to re-offend, so it was determined that he needed to stay for some inpatient care. Is that correct? He did stay for inpatient care, yes. And you did not see him at a high risk? Um, I don't recall I saw him as a high risk or not. He went uh, to treatment and he stayed in care. It was deemed by the professionals at St. John Vianney, the same ones that interviewed and found Father Sullivan to be at risk, that was at risk. Correct? Uh, when he finished treatment in my phone conversation with them, uh, the one gal speaking for the group there uh, said uh, she would be happy if he were her pastor. Well, he, yeah, that's what she said. When, when Jim Clausen says it was determined that he was at high risk, you don't know, then, who determined uh, was that high risk? This is what Father, this is what Mr. Clausen is saying. I don't recall uh, the treatment center saying he was at high risk. Certainly, my recollection is when he was finished with treatment, uh, that statement would not be true. So you chose to take a risk when you made the decision to allow to continue in ministry unrestricted, correct? No, I made one argumentative. Argumentative. Did you calculate a risk? It was a reason. Uh, a reasonable decision. He had been determined to be a high risk, hadn't he? Not when he was done with treatment. But at St. John Vianney? Correct? At St. John Vianney. But you overrode that their determination that he had been at high risk and believe he was at what kind of risk? Uh, as I said, at the end of treatment, uh, 
I don't believe he was a high risk, and that's what I was told, and therefore it was a reasonable decision. Who told you he was not a risk? Um, who? Uh, high risk. Uh, the person speaking for the team at St. John Vianney indicated he was not a high risk. Who? I don't remember her name. It was a woman. Jim Clausen is saying the St. John Vianney team is saying he was a high risk. Correct. Um, I don't know that that's true. Certainly not at the end of his treatment, I would say it's not true. And your testimony here today is that somebody at St. J John Vianney told you that was not a risk? Is that your testimony today? Well, now today? you dropped the word high out. My t statement was she told mm -hmm. me that she would be pleased or happy to have as her pastor. Did you discuss risk with her? I don't recall. I imagine we did. What, were, what was her role at, at the St. John Vianney Center in evaluating? She was one of his caregivers. Well, do you know if she was a psychiatrist, a psychologist? I don't recall. I don't recall. Do you know even what, how, how involved she was in the actual treatment? She was involved. She was speaking for the team, is my recollection. So her uh, statement to you that she would be happy to have him as one of her pastors, was that enough for you to make the determination that he was not a risk in her opinion? It was one of the considerations, sure. So upon whom else did you rely then um, at St. John Vianney besides this woman whose name you can't remember or identify? The team that, that dealt with him. The same letter uh, it goes on to state, the next step was to consult the Board of Review. You agreed and we did. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And on that Board of Review, uh, who was on that? I don't recall. There were six members. You remember that, don't you? Could have been. There's, well, there's it's, six. It, it's referred to in there. I so, see that, yes. Okay. It goes on to state, at the initial meeting, the board reviewed the assessment report and the two complaints that we had received against. What were those two complaints? I, I do not recall. You have no memory of what complaints? I don't recall. I, I mentioned a bit ago uh, there was a adult bookstore thing. Um, um, that's what I recall. Do you recall any of the complaints or either of these being referred to here as having to do with concerns in his relationship with minors? Um, I don't recall that. I, I, I recall um, maybe a concern, uh, time spent with minors, with, with young, uh, with minors. Well, that would be a, a deep concern in 2014, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, there was, there was no accusation of impropriety. Well, spending time with, with a minor alone would be a cause for concern, wouldn't it? Maybe. Uh, there was no accusation of impropriety, though. Wouldn't it require some investigation and or um, um, inquiry into what the real relationship is? Obviously, Father David uh, 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 listened to that and, and yes, received, received that. It goes on to state, um, you don't remember what the two complaints that are being referred to here are then? I don't know the specific two, no, that he's referring to. It goes on to state, at that time, Board Chairman John Jeffries stated that we know from previous experience that treatment for this type of behavior does not work. 
what previous experience did you and the board know uh, uh, that treatment for this type of behavior does not work? I don't know what he's referring to. Well, there's a, the, the, are you aware that pedophilia is something that is, 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 and the treatment for it does not work? Um, I've heard that. And are, are you also aware that that's what's being referred to here? Objection no. calls for speculation. No. Enjoy. What treatment is, is being referred to here that does not work? Objection that calls this for board chair um, um, is making a statement about? Objection calls for speculation. An answer if you have to form foundation. Do you know? Uh, well, what treatment? Uh, I, would, I would say they're referring to, to uh, as he begins his treatment. Treatment for what? It certainly wasn't for pedophilia. Well, what was it for? It was general uh, treatment for uh, well-being. Didn't it pertain also to complaints and concerns about his recently relationship with youth? Uh, I imagine it had to do with boundaries, uh, that we keep the proper boundaries and so on. Um, seems to me there were some issues with his father and so on. And there was the issue of the uh, adult bookstore. That's my recollection. Now you constituted this review board, did you not? I did. And to help you make with the Father ultimate David. To, uh, to help you as the bishop to make the ultimate decision whether a priest should be removed, whether a priest should be restricted, whether a priest should be limited in his activities in the diocese, right? Correct. They're consultors to you, right? Correct. They are the ones that make the decision. They consult. Correct. You are the you're the decider. Correct. Okay. He then writes to sum up the first meeting. It was six zero that he should not be put back into ministry. We as a diocese could not take that chance. You read that, didn't you? I did. You saw that the board that you consulted, that you appointed to consult you, said there was a risk, and it was unanimous that he could not and should not be put back in the ministry. Correct? At that time. And you did put him back in the ministry, didn't you? Not at that time. How My, soon after this? Well, he finished treatment. How soon after this? I don't recall how long that was, his treatment, but uh, it was until he had completed his treatment that uh, he was put back into ministry. So you overrode the board's recommendation, did you not? This was a first meeting that, as he says, the first step, uh, that was not the final. Was there ever a board recommendation? to you um, uh, to place in treatment, uh, excuse me, in ministry? Some on the board said yes, some have reservations. That's my recollection, it was split. There was never a board recommendation to you uh, to place back in ministry, correct, Bishop? Objection, yes and answered. Some on the board were in favor of it some on the board had reservations. Actually, it went to a, a vote later, and it was a 5-1 vote, wasn't it? Not to put him back in ministry. No, that's not my recollection. Let's go to the second paragraph above um, the last paragraph on the first page. The paragraph starts, the review board met again to discuss this case and to review a summary of the services the St. John Vienne had provided. <clears throat> it was an interesting meeting because Father Super was not present for the meeting, and I never did hear why he did not attend. The tone of that meeting was very similar to the first meeting, except this time Chairman Jeffries seemed to be wavering from his original statement. He writes, there was never, 
there never was another vote taken. But my recollection of the meeting is that if a vote had been taken, it would have been about five to one against him returning to ministry. So you read that, didn't you? I did. And so at this point in time, the board, and he's telling you that the board is five to one against returning the ministry. That's right? what he's saying. Mm -hmm. The next sentence uh, states the first care team meeting was held in your office. That's not the next sentence. That's the next paragraph. Oh, excuse me. The next paragraph states, the first care team meeting was held in your office. Do you remember that? Uh, no. It, he then writes, began his presentation by falsely representing the facts about his relationships with a couple of families. Do you remember that? No. He then writes, he doesn't even talk about his longtime relationship with a minor that is so secretive that to this day he will not address it. What do you remember about that? I don't. Do you remember reading this? I do. Did you ask? Clausen, what are you referring to here? I don't remember that I did. This is referring to a meeting in your office. Do you remember um, him being asked about his longtime relationship with Objection, asked and answered. Um, um, and it, it being secretive? Do you remember a discussion about that? No. Is this news to you? You're smiling. Why are you laughing about this? Is this funny to you? Why are you smiling, sir? Because this is Mr. Clausen's recollection, and I don't know that it's accurate. I don't remember it, but there are other things that aren't accurate, and so we're talking about his opinion. He's your safety environment coordinator. He's the one appointed and hired by you as the bishop and the diocese at Grosvenor to make sure the kids are safe. Objection, right? representative. Right? Correct. So why are you being dismissive of what he writes and what the board recommends? Because Objection, he's argumentative. Uh, Is there a question? Concur. Why are you, sir? He's inaccurate. What he's saying isn't true. It doesn't say the story correctly. What is the correct story? The correct story is the review board met and met again and uh, at the end, it was a split. Some were in favor of him being back in ministry. Took that into consideration. Took into consideration some did not think he should be in ministry. Took into consideration what the treatment center folks were telling me and uh, made a decision to go back into ministry with uh, a team to, to watch his aftercare, with a super, supervision and monitoring, myself and the pastor, and he, uh, for the rest of his ministry, did wonderful work. So when it's written here, he doesn't even talk about his longtime relationship with a minor. Do you know who John is? You mentioned here a minute ago. Yes. yes. Do you know, did you make any effort to, to find out what his relationship was with John by either talking to John or his parents? I believe I did. Uh, seems to me I had a phone call with him. Mr. eventually got married, and, and there was never any complaint from him uh, against, uh, the, to my knowledge, of impropriety. Did you ask Mr. I, I recall, it uh, seems I did speak with him on the phone. When did you make I that call? I don't remember. Why did you make that call? Uh, because his name had come up. I understand. Did you make any notes of that call? I don't recall. 
You had a safety coordinator, Jim Clawson. What involvement did he have in your decision to make this call that you claim you made? I don't recall he had any. I don't know. So was this call. was this call to before October 27th, 2014, the date of this exhibit, I or after? Remember. I don't remember. Well, why did you make the call? Uh, as part of uh, care after uh, back in ministry uh, to make sure things were going fine. Was was in ministry at the time you made the call? To uh, it seems to me it was. Uh, I don't remember exactly when I spoke to Mr. Before, before telling me this here today, you told anybody else that you had called? I don't recall. I don't recall. Did you enlist any, any professionals or the victim assist, uh, the safe environment coordinator in, in making the call to, to I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember. I don't know if. I don't, I don't remember. Did you it make? It seems to me, as I said, that I spoke with Mr. At some point. You're not sure, are you? No, I. Uh, it seems to me, uh, or Father David did. Uh, that's my recollection. When you say Father David, you're referring to whom? Vicar General, at that time. Last name? Baumgarten. Okay. But you're not sure if you made a call or David Von Gerber. I can't remember. And um, thus, do you know if any notes were made by you? I don't recall that, no. Do you know if any notes were made by Von Gardner, if any call was ever made? I don't. So you have a, rec a big recollection of, of you or Von Gardner having called me and that uh, what do you know about what said? I don't recall there was any uh, problem with he and there certainly was no accusation of impropriety. Did you or to your knowledge ever, uh, uh, your knowledge, did you or Baumgartner ever ask, did engage you in any inappropriate conduct while you were a youth? I don't remember that specific question though. No. Why not? I Why don't remember. You? The next sentence at the next page states, I found it real interesting that the very first person he had contact with when he returned from St. John's Vienna Center is um, Did that alarm you? I don't recall. He then writes, in safe environment, we call this behavior, quote, grooming, unquote. Does that description written to you by your safe environment coordinator uh, alarm you? No. In the second to the last sentence in that paragraph, he writes, the meeting eventually ended, and I was convinced more than ever that keeping him in ministry was a bad decision. Did you try to support or tell Jim Clawson why you thought he was wrong and you were right in your decision to put and continue him in ministry? I don't recall specifically. Uh, Did you ever talk to Jim's parents or try to or ask any of your subordinates? I uh, don't recall.
did you or anybody at your specific direction ever contact any other families who made complaints or raised concerns about I don't recall. Should we take a short break? Sure. We're going off the record at 10.03 a.m. Uh, Bishop, uh, we took uh, the testimony from Jim Clausen by deposition, just like this, um, earlier some weeks ago. And in it, he testified under oath that had also been sent to treatment in uh, St. Louis 20 years uh, before uh, he was sent to uh, St. John Vianney uh, by the diocese. Do you know why he had been sent to treatment 20 years before? No. Had you ever heard that statement made to you before I just told you Clausen had said it? Yeah. I don't recall. I don't know. I don't recall. Well, does it concern you hearing that today, then? If Does it cause you to be concerned? Concerned? No. If you've been sent to treatment 20 years before, and you're sent to treatment at St. John's Vianney, and then you return to ministry uh, after that, and, and your safety coordinator is saying it's, it's, a, it's an undue risk, doesn't that additional information about that earlier treatment make you want to know what happened 20 years ago? Section asked and answer. It's argumentative as well. Join. Don't you want to know? It doesn't concern me today. It concerns me. Why don't you want to know that? It doesn't concern me today. Uh, returned to ministry. He did good work. Uh, and he's now out of ministry. He's sick. But you yourself said that past behavior is a good predictor of future behavior, didn't you? Objection misstates his testimony. Concur. You agreed to that statement, yeah, didn't you? And then I said, maybe take the word good out, and maybe it's a predictor, but people change. So don't you think that knowing why he was sent to treatment as Clausen had testified that he had uh, 20 years ago is something that should be known by you in considering, and should have been, been known by you, uh, in considering putting uh, back in the ministry after his uh, return from St. John Vianney? Objection, argumentative. Don't you think that's something you should it have done? It doesn't concern me. You had access to uh, medical records. Um, Did you ever review all the treatment records that uh, they did at St. John Vianney? On, on I believe I did. I'm going to turn uh, for a moment to uh, uh, the matter of Rod Bosick. And, uh, When in time, Bishop, did you first learn of Ron Bosick's allegation against uh, Monsignor Grunhoff? Ron Bosick came to see me, my recollection is, in 2011, in September. And um, you had learned of uh, something before he came to see you, had you not? To what do you refer? You had gotten a phone call. Yes. Okay. Monsignor Gehring from Fargo Diocese had called. 
And um, and when was that? That was in September of 2011. Okay. And what did Monsignor Guerin tell you? He told me that uh, Mr. Vasek uh, had talked to one of his priests, one of the priests in the diocese, uh, and wanted to, uh, and that he had told him to come and talk to me. That's my recollection. And did Monsignor Guerin tell you that there had been an allegation of sexual misconduct? I don't House? recall how he phrased it, but Mr. Vasek was uh, was wanting to come and, and, and talk to me uh, about an incident in his history. Guerin told you that Vasek wanted to talk to you? Correct. That's my recollection. What else did Garin tell you? I don't recall, uh, uh, and I told him that I would call Mr. Vasek and uh, make the arrangements for him to come and see me. Did you tell anybody about the call from Monsignor Garin from Fargo? I don't recall that I did. Did you see it and, and understand it to have been a serious allegation at the time you received uh, the call from Garin? No. I don't. Uh, um, my recollection was I was going to hear what Mr. Vasek had to say. Did you know it involved the allegation of, of, of uh, sexual abuse of a I teenager? I don't recall specifically what Monsignor Gehring said. Uh, no, I don't recall that at that point. Didn't Gehring tell you that um, Ron had reported um, that Grundhaus had sexually molested him as, I don't as recall, a teenager? I don't recall specifically what Monsignor Gehring said in that phone call, no. You don't recall that there was an allegation of sexual misconduct or not? Section asked and answered now what for Mr. the fifth Gehring, time. Father Gehring told me in that phone call, but the, my recollection is that I would go on and uh, make an make a, uh, appointment for Father or for Mr. Vasek to come and see me. So when you made the appointment with Ron Vasek, who was in the diaconate program, um, did you know that the purpose of the meeting was to find out uh, more about what? What was the purpose of the meeting? To hear what Mr. Vasek had to say. And I believe at that point he was not in the deacon program. Well, my question is, is did you know the topic of the meeting was Grundhaus? I don't recall that I did. Did you know the topic of the meeting had anything to do with the suspicions of sexual misconduct years before by Grundhaus against Basic when he was a teenager? Objection has been answered. Now for the sixth time, Council. Don't recall that I did. Okay. So um, how soon after the call from Gehring did you arrange a meeting with Basic? Uh, within the week, I believe. Uh, we met on a Monday, September 19th. And so the phone call would have been the week before. And did you tell anybody about the call from Gary? Uh, to my recollection, no. And uh, did you tell anybody that you arranged to have a meeting with Ron Vasek? Uh, to my recollection, no. Uh, Did you, um, what did you understand the purpose of the meeting of, with Ron Vasek then to have been when you set it up? Uh, to listen to what he had to tell me, to listen to what he had to say. Do you remember that Grundhaus, um, was the topic or pertaining to the purpose of the meeting? I'm going to Jack asked and answered. Objection, asked and answered again. No, it's not. Do not recall. What, at the time of the meeting, was your relationship with, with Monsignor Grindhouse? In 2011, it seems to me Monsignor Grindhouse had just um, re 
retired and was senior was a senior priest. Uh, it seems that that's the timeline for him. Did you make any notes of the meeting? Uh, I did. We've never seen anything produced. Have you ever produced anything that pertains to the notes of the meeting? Um, yes, I believe I gave council notes. Tom, do you have any? Let's go off the record for a minute. Okay. We are going off the record at 10.23 a.m. We are back on the record at 10.24 a.m. We just had a conference about that, and um, Mr. Braun is going to check to see if uh, there are, in fact, notes. And uh, our recollection is we haven't seen any, but we'll do a, a, a meet and confer at a break on that and, and sort it out. Where was the meeting with Vasek? It was in my office. And describe for us then the meeting that you had with Ron Vasek on September, did you say 19? Yes. Uh, he came to my office. He told me he wanted to tell me his story my recollection, uh, he uh, asked for confidentiality that I not reveal what he was to say to anybody, his telling me his wife did not know, his son did not know about this. Um, he told me that uh, he said when he was 16 in, on a trip to Columbus, Ohio, on senior as they stayed in a room, uh, Monsignor Grinhaus, uh he said, uh, grabbed his genitals, and then and later he said, made an effort to grab his genitals through his underwear. Um, we talked about, uh, I, I listened to his story. I offered him counseling. Um, I talked to him about the Charter for the Protection of Young People and asked him if he wanted to uh, make an accusation public. Uh, our policy is that the Vicar General receives accusations of sexual abuse of minors by clergy. He said, absolutely not. I do not want to bring this forward. I ask that you keep it confidential. Um, that's my recollection. He was, he wondered whether there was anything, uh, any other report against Monsignor Grinhaus ever made. And uh, to my knowledge, I said there was not. So he, he took that. He talked about joining, I think he, I think he talked about joining the deacon program. And I said, that would be fine. You know, that would be fine. That's kind of my recollection. You stated that he wanted, you asked him if he wanted to make the accusation public. According to our policy, accusations of sexual misconduct against minors is made to the Vicar General. I invited him if he wanted to do that. He said, absolutely not. Well, to the Vicar General and to the public are two different uh, entities. So when you said uh, at, that you asked him if you wanted to make it public, um, what did that mean to you if that's what you said to him? Did he want to bring forth an accusation according to the Charter uh, and norms uh, of sexual abuse by Monsignor Grinhouse. He said no. Okay. And when you use the term the public, 
Oh, who is that referred to? Bring forward uh, according to the norms of the Charter. That's what I mean. The norms of the Charter provide for the internal handling of uh, uh, certain abuse complaints also, do they not? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. And then it requires public disclosures in certain circumstances. So when you asked him if you wanted to make the accusation public, was that with um, within the diocese or to the public at large? It was, uh, my, my recollection is that, uh, did he want to bring this forward uh, to all entities? He was free to do so. Uh, and, and he said, absolutely not. You knew Monsignor Grenhaus quite, quite well, did you not? I knew Monsignor. And he had been an official in the diocese and a priest of the diocese for a long time correct. prior to you being bishop there, correct? correct? And so you had a close relationship with him. I don't know if our relationship was close, but he was a priest of the diocese and I'd, I'd met him before. And you did not want what Ron Vasek had told you Grunhaus had done to him to be public, did you? Uh, it was totally up to Mr. Vasek. I certainly respected uh, what uh, he was saying. Uh, I offered him the avenue to, to move this forward. Uh, he it was totally up to him. Uh, that's why I brought it up. He said he did not want to do that. I asked what you wanted. You did not want the accusation that Ron Vasek had made to you to be made public. That's incorrect. You wanted to be made public? It was totally up to Mr. Vasek. No, I'm asking, did you want it to be made public? Uh, it, didn't, it didn't enter my mind what I wanted, whether to make it public or not. That wasn't a consideration. The consideration is what Mr. Vasek wanted. Um, in the uh, answers that uh, Ron Vosk has given to questions put to him by the attorneys for the diocese, he has stated that at that meeting, you, Bishop Hepner, yelled at him for making the accusation against Monsignor Grundhaus. <clears throat> Did you yell at him? Absolutely not. Did you get upset at him? Absolutely not. Did you uh, speak with disapproval to him? Um, about him accusing this longtime uh, uh, Monsignor uh, of the diocese of sexual misconduct? Absolutely not. Did you ask him if he was going to bring criminal charges against Grunhaus? I did not. Why not? I asked him if he wanted to bring this forward in any form, uh, and he said he did not. Did you tell him, as he asserts in his answers to interrogatories, that um, Monsignor Grunthaus was a great priest and the allegations would ruin his reputation? Absolutely not. Were you trying to silence Ron Vasek? Absolutely not. Did you, um, as Ron Vasek has asserted in his answers to interrogatories in this case, um, defend Monsignor Grunthaus before even asking uh, Ron Vasek what happened between him and Grunhaus? Absolutely not. Did you, um, as Ron Vasek has uh, uh, asserted under oath, in his answers to interrogatories um, pertaining to this meeting that um, you stated to him that it would be detrimental to Monsignor Grundhaus and his reputation if the allegations he was making were public. Did you say that? No. Did you suggest that? No. He also asserts under oath that you told him, as bishop in this meeting, that no one else should know about the abuse, not even plaintiff's wife. Did you, did you tell him nobody should know? 
And no. this should be kept secret? Absolutely not. He told you that his wife did not know, did Correct. He? And he did not want her to know. Do you recall him asking what impact this would have on his diaconate? Possibly, yes. Uh, and I told him he certainly would be free to join the program, and he did. Did you tell him, as he asserts in his answers to the interrogatories, that it would not be a problem for his diaconate so long as he did not mention the abuse to anyone else? Absolutely not. Council, just for clarification, are you reading from plaintiff's answers to interrogatories yes. dated October 1, 2018? Yes. Thank you. Did you tell him, um, uh, as he answered in a, a response to their interrogatories, the following, this is a cross you're going to have to carry? I don't recall that, no. Did you tell him that um, sometimes we have to keep things to ourselves? No, I don't recall that. Do you deny suggesting to him, implying to him, or expressing to him that you wanted him to keep this secret and quiet? I deny that, yes. He answers that, uh, in his answers to interrogatories, that he felt pressured by you not to disclose the abuse to anyone else. Did you pressure him? Absolutely not. He, he answers under oath that he felt threatened and intimidated to stay silent, and that was by you. Do you deny that? I do. Quite the contrary. I invited him if he wanted to to bring this forward. Is there anything else that you remember about that meeting that, uh, that you have not recited? No, I, uh, that's my recollection. Council, let's take a pause for a minute. I've got the notes that uh, Bishop was referring to. I'm asking Chris for the Bates range, but I can forward, forward them to Ellen right now, so okay. give the benefit of those. Thank you. Let's go off the record. We are going off the record at 10.36 a.m. We are back on the record at 10.38 a.m. Uh, in the meeting, did you either accuse or suggest Ron, to Ron Bosick that the accusation he was making against Grundhouse was, was false? No. Did you believe Ron? I listened to him. Uh, you know, uh, when someone comes in, you certainly listen uh, favorably to him. Uh, and that's what I did, yeah. My question is, did, did you believe him when he, when he told you that he had been engaged in inappropriate sexual conduct as a teenager by Monsignor Grunhaus uh, in the early 70s? I believed what he was saying, that, that he believed what he was saying, yes. I listened to him. Did you understand that? In a supportive that? way, yes. Did you understand that it was an accusation of sexual abuse? Uh, he's telling me his story and that he does not want to make, he does not want to bring forth, according to the Charter, an accusation. That's what I understood. But did you understand that he was telling you of uh, an accusation of sexual abuse by Monsignor Grundhouse of him as a teenager. I understood that he was telling me his story and that he did not want to bring forth, according to the norms in the Charter, an accusation against Monsignor. But what he told you, did you, did you believe him? I believe that he believed what he was telling me, that this happened. Did you believe it to be false? I believed he believed what he was telling me happened, and I made no judgment on that. I just listened. Did you believe it to be true? I just listened. 
What did you do to see if it was true or false? I just listened. But following the meeting, what did you do to see if it was true or false? He asked me to keep the matter totally confidential, and that's what I did. Were you aware that in the Code of Conduct Policy, uh, Section 9 of the diocese, utilized in the U.S. Catholic Conference and Charter uh, for the Protection of Children, the diocese policy states that even if a person, such as Ron Vosick, makes an ac accusation such as this, uh, and reports it to you, um, and there is still a risk, that means the priest is still out there, um, you must, under that policy, you must advise that person, in this case, Ron Vasek, that you have to report it? Were you aware of that? I said to Mr. Vasek that I would keep this confidential because that's what he wanted. My question is, were you aware of this policy? I know what the policy says, yes. So you know the policy? I know what the policy says. And you know the policy says that even if Ron Vasek is reporting the allegation to you of sexual abuse um, and wants to keep it confidential, you are obliged under this policy to tell him you're required to report it. I told him I would keep it confidential. So when you told him that, did you know you were violating the policy of the Diocese of Crookston in writing Section 9 adopted by the Charter? I did not have that recollection at that moment, no. When did you learn you were violating the policy, when you, when you told Ronnie to keep it quiet and not? Just a moment, let me finish. When did you learn your decision to handle Ron Vosick's complaint the way you did, responsive to what he said, was in violation of Section 9 in the Code of Conduct under the U.S. Charter, if you did? Later. How much later? I don't recall. When was Father Monsignor Grundhaus first advised uh, or even asked about uh, the accusation that Ron Basak had made of sexual misconduct against him. When Ron Basak, um, through your office, my recollection is through your office, uh, brought this forward, uh, that's when Monsignor found out about it, I believe. So it was after the public lawsuit that we brought wasn't it? I believe so. Grundhouse first was I believe so. And you, you never contacted Grundhaus to find out if he had abused Ron Vasek, had I you? kept the matter, as Mr. Vasek requested, completely confidential. Yeah, but if he, if Grundhaus had abused Ron Vasek, as he had claimed you did, and you believed him to be telling the truth, didn't you become concerned that there could have been other kids that Check. Grundhaus could have been done this to? Objection misstates his testimony. Join. As I said, uh, Ron Vasek asked about other possible uh, people saying there was violations, and as I told him, there was nothing that I knew of in his record that this had ever been uh, brought forward before. And so Mr. Vasek chose to keep the matter confidential, and he himself did not come forward for years. Well, you, you said you were respecting Ron Vosick's wishes that it be remain, remain my private. My question to you is, did you think about the fact that there may be other kids at risk the same way Ron Vosick had been as a kid? Did you think about that? At the time, you agreed to keep this private and agreed to keep it silent. In answer to Mr. Vasek's question, were there others? Uh, we talked about there were no others. Well, you told me earlier that when Brian Vasek came in to see you, you didn't even know this pertained to Grundhaus. How can you? How could you have said there were no others pertaining to Grundhaus? 
objection. The state's testimony said he didn't recall. Mr. Vasek asked, were there any other accusations in his file that this ever was brought forward by anyone else? And I told him, no. Well, did you review the Grindhaus file before he met with Vasek? I said, to my knowledge, at that moment, there were none. Wait a minute. That's did you review the Grindhaus file maintained by the diocese, either the secret file or the personnel file, or any file maintained by it, prior to the meeting with Ron Vasek? No. Well, then you made the representation then to Ron Vasek that there are no other, other things in his file. You didn't actually know that because you hadn't reviewed the file. I had not heard that there were any, no. So you had not heard any other allegations made, correct? That's correct. So you lied to Ron Vasek when you told him that there were no other allegations yeah. made? Objection, argumentative. You don't yeah. have to answer that question, okay. Bishop. Okay. Did you lie to Ron Vasek? I don't have to answer that question. Yes, you do. This did question, you this question. Uh, no, I did not. When you told Ron Vasek that no other allegations about Grundhaus, you had not investigated Grundhaus, had to you? To my knowledge, at that moment, there were, I knew of no accusations against Monsignor, and that's what I told Mr. Vasek. And when you told him that you knew of no other allegations, you told him there were no other allegations, and you had not even reviewed the file. Is that correct? I told him I knew of no accusations against Monsignor. And you had not reviewed the file? At that moment, I had not. And you had not conducted any investigation? Correct. And you had not asked anybody else about Grundhaus, and if there ever had been allegations, correct? Correct. The diocese policy uh, that we have reviewed and I'm referring to also says that the Vicar General must be informed of an accusation uh, such as this when made. Did you inform the then Vicar General of the accusation? No. Do you know you were violating the policy by having not done so? Not at that moment. When did you learn you had? Later. How much later? I don't recall. There is a... Uh, Is it correct then to say that you did, you took no further action responsive to the information given you first by Monsignor Gehring and then by Ron Vasek in this meeting that pertained to Grand House? I believe that's correct, yes. You kept the secret, correct? I did. I kept the confidentiality. There was a second meeting with Ron Avasek. How did that come about? The, uh, the two dioceses, Fargo and Crookston, next to each other, uh, were putting together a list of priests who could substitute across border lines and uh, Father Monsignor Foltz was notified that Monsignor Grinhouse's name would be off the list from Fargo. That precipitated another meeting with Mr. Vasek and myself um, because I wanted to know, I wanted him to know that and, and in that way Monsignor Grinhaus uh, might become aware that there's something uh, of the reason for that. So you knew that in the Doe 19 case, our office had gotten an, a court order from uh, and issued by uh, Judge Marvin that ordered the Diocese of Crookston to produce the names and identities of priests uh, accused of sexual abuse of minors, correct? Later, correct? Yes. And you knew that, that Judge Marvin had ordered that prior to your second meeting with Ron Vasek, correct? Uh, I don't know the date of, of that. Uh, the second meeting was in 2015. Yes. 
Okay. So I'm asking you what you knew about the court order. What, I asked, why did you have a second meeting with Ron Vasek? You said because there had been a court order, correct? No, no. Well, why did you have a second meeting with Vasek? Because the Fargo Diocese was putting together a list of priests who could substitute in Fargo. Okay, the Fargo Diocese. Correct, not with Judge Marler. And, um, and so what was it that, that caused you to meet with Ron Vasek then that pertained to the Fargo list? because Monsignor's name was going to be left off, and Monsignor would, might inquire why. Um, Monsignor Grundhouse's name was going to be left off? Correct. Who told you that? Uh, I believe Monsignor Gehring of the Fargo Diocese told Monsignor Foltz. Monsignor Foltz told me. Did you tell, did they tell why the name was to be left off? I don't know what they told Monsignor Foltz, but again, I was keeping complete confidentiality, so I didn't say anything. Uh, I called Mr. Vasek and asked him to come for a meeting so we could discuss what to do. And tell us what happened and was said at that meeting. Where was the meeting first? Well, it was later in the afternoon. I happened to be home, so he came to my residence. You requested he come to your residence. Uh, that's correct. Meeting. That's where I set the meeting. Okay. And um, well, why did you have anybody else present? Because it's confidential. Okay. And so I uh, told Mr. Vasek uh, that Monsignor's name was going to be left off, and and if he inquired of me, how. Uh, would I handle that? And uh, after we talked about it, uh, we left it. And my recollection is that I would say you could talk to Ron Vasek about that. And uh, how long was the meeting with Vasek? Oh, I don't know, 45 minutes maybe. And what was your purpose of calling him to your residence? To talk with him about the fact that Monsignor's name was going to be left off the Fargo list, and if Monsignor had questions about that, as to why, uh, what, what we should do, and it was left that he, he could be told to call Ron Vasek. Did you have concerns about Grunhaus's name being left off the Fargo list? It was just a fact. Well, did it concern you? It just was a fact. I don't know if it was a concern. Well, the concern was Mr. Vasek wanted to keep his story confidential. That was the concern. Yeah, but didn't you have concerns about the fact that Grunhaus had been accused of sexual abuse? and he wasn't going to be on a list, at least as you understood it, for Monsignor Foltz uh, to be published by the diocese? It's a fact. Well, what did you think the purpose of the list is that it were, were being required to be put up by the diocese? Those priests who could substitute in across the borders. Well, the list was, was a list of, of those accused of offenses? No, no. What list are you talking about? the priests who could substitute in the Fargo Diocese from Crookston. Okay, so the Fargo Diocese was saying Grunhaus was not fit to be put at eligible. They were leaving substitute. his name off the list. Okay, I misunderstood the list. Okay, that's right. Okay, got it. Grunhaus is in Moorhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fargo, Moorhead. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> So, so just so I understand, because I misunderstood uh, here, that is my fault. So, so we can get back on the same page here. You are informed that Grundhouse is not going to be made. Grundhouse is going to be made ineligible to work outside the diocese in Fargo diocese. In correct. Fargo diocese. Yep. And Monsignor Fultz told you that. Correct. And when Monsignor Fultz told you that Grundhouse was going to be ineligible because what Fargo knew 
about Grand House and Basic. What Monsignor Gehring and Father Leffer, two priests, knew. Okay. As far as, far as I knew. Right. And so um, when Monsignor Fultz told you that Grand House was going to be made uh, ineligible, in, in other words, um, what did you say to Fultz? I don't recall what I said to him, but again, I was keeping this matter confidential, and so I got a hold of Mr. Vasek to talk about it with him. And what do you, uh, t what is the date of this second meeting where you called him to your, your residence? It was in October of 2015, 21st, I believe. And the records show October 21st, 2015, the order in, uh, in Doe uh, Do 19 was issued by Judge Marvin ordering the diocese to produce the identities of uh, the priests accused of sexual abuse of minors and to produce that to our office uh, under court order. You were aware of that order? Uh, I don't recall that I was at that moment. Do you remember having that in mind when you called Vasek no, to your? I did not have that in mind. Okay. Anything else that you said to Ron Vasek in that meeting? I don't, I don't recall exactly. Um, he's in the deacon program, and uh, again, he's free to, to, to bring this forward, and, and he's telling me he does not want to do that. And uh, I then, uh, in canon law, you know, things have to be in writing. So that was my thought. And so I said to him, you know, uh, you don't want to bring this forward. Uh, uh, how, how about putting that in writing? So I asked him about putting that in writing. My recollection was he he said uh, I wouldn't want to sign any, I wouldn't want to sign anything that's not true, and I said to him, I would never ask you to sign anything that's true. That's true or not true? I, I would never ask you to sign anything that's not true. Thank you. Yeah, correct. Uh, and so that's how we got into this, this statement. Uh, and I said, I'd, I'd like that in writing, that you do not want to bring this forward to make an official accusation, to go to the Vicar General who handles all the accusations of sexual abuse uh, of, of minors by clergy. And so we got into that remember that. And was there discussion about his, the status of his diaconate and being jeopardized? Not to my recollection, there was no, there was no jeopardy, jeopardy uh, one way or another to his diaconate. D was there discussion? It may have been. I don't, uh, uh, it may have been. Uh, I don't specifically recall. Did you put something in writing and require him to sign it? I did. I didn't. My recollection is, as I think about that, I did not have our diocesan stationery or my stationery at home. And so the next morning, I went to the office and typed out personally on stationery a statement uh, and, and called him. And he came in and signed it that next morning, which actually is the 22nd. But we da he, we dated it uh, the day before because that was our discussion. So it says, I freely, uh, regarding the trip I had with the priest of the Diocese of Crooks, and didn't even put his name in because I'm keeping confidentiality, uh, do not and don't, don't want to bring forward an accusation. And the next morning, Mr. Vasek signed that. So it's your recollection that there was a second meeting that followed this meeting uh, and he came back at your request that, and signed That's my statement? recollection, yeah, that he came back to my office and signed that the next morning. There was no real meeting. He just came in and signed it. 
And, uh, so I thought about that. that. That's my recollection now. You're not sure about that, are you? I, I, I think that's what happened, yes. In the, in the answers to interrogatories that Ryan Vasek has given and um, under oath, has said that um, um, pertaining to this meeting, that you told him because of uh, the allegation he had made against Grunhaus that Monsignor Grunhaus was going to be forbidden from exercising ministry in the Diocese of Fargo. Do you recall telling him that? No, at our first meeting, I explained what happens. Uh, this is this, the, the, the first meeting, yes. Well, at the first meeting, I explained to him what happens uh, when a priest uh, either admits or is found guilty of according to the charter, the three, he doesn't wear the collar, he's refu re, uh, re, removed from ministry, and he's not allowed to be called father. I reviewed that with him when I, in the first meeting, at the char uh, when I talked to him about the charter, yes. When you say the first meeting, are you talking about the October 21 meeting? No, September uh, meeting in 2011. Okay, I'm talking about October now. Okay. Okay. You've called him to your private residence. You've called him to your private residence because you've learned that Grand House is being determined ineligible um, for uh, assignment because of the Vasek allegation, he's, correct? He's being ineligible in the Diocese of Fargo to substitute. Yes. That's right. In ministry, correct. Okay. So. Uh, and at that meeting, did you tell Ron Vasek that uh, the diocese um, was making him ineligible because of Ron's allegation? No. What did you tell him the purpose of calling him to the residence to be have, have been there? That, that he was not on the list in Fargo Diocese of priests who could substitute from the Crookston Diocese. Why did you call Ron to your private residence? Because of the hour of the day. That's where I happened to be later but in the day. What was your purpose in having him come to your private <laughs> residence? What did you want him to know or do? To discuss with him what we would do What if Monsignor had questions about why I cannot substitute in the Fargo Diocese. You didn't want Grunhaus to be made ineligible for ministry, did you? Objection. It was not a consideration. You didn't care? Wasn't it, I didn't consider that at that moment. You already had something prepared for Ron to sign at the, at the time he, uh, he showed up for that meeting, did you not? Objection did to the not. state's testimony. No. He, Ron Vasek has testified that um, you asked him to sign a letter um, and that a letter had been authorized, had been authored by Monsign by Michael Vicar General Michael Volz. Is that correct? I understand that's what Mr. Vasek said, and that's absolutely incorrect. Okay, you I, authored the letter. Correct. And you authored it on what computer? Uh, a computer at my office. Uh, the next morning. That's my recollection. And then uh, it's your recollection that you asked Ron to come back in? Uh, the next morning to sign the statement, yes. And it's your recollection he did? Correct. And you're certain about that sequence of events? That's my recollection, yes. And when you composed the letter, um, um, did you share it with anybody else? No. Was um, a Monsignor, the Vicar General Fultz, involved in that? No. I'm keeping confidentiality. Whose idea was it to create and have Ron sign the letter? That was mine. And what particular computer did you use? The what device? 
one in my at my office. It was a it's one of these that hooked in. And was the electronic copy of that saved? You know, I, I got a new computer a year ago, and uh, I don't believe the, the other one is saved, no. Why not? I, uh, normal procedure. Who was given a copy of the letter? No one was given a copy of the letter. It was confidential. Where are the copies of the letter kept then? Uh, I have it. When you get a new computer, you save all the material on your old computer. It's all transported over. Why wasn't it? It wasn't saved on my computer. Why wasn't it saved? Because it's confidential. Was that to protect Grundhouse? Uh, it to keep the confidentiality from Mr. Bossett. Was a letter that you originally crafted on your computer, which no longer exists in its original form, ever modified? No. I'm going to show you Exhibit 9. Oh, no, excuse me, Exhibit 6. So what's the date you prepared this letter? I believe it was uh, the 22nd of uh, October, 2015. Um, the date that appears on it is October 21st, 2015. Correct. My recollection is that's the date because that's when we talked about it. So you had him sign this letter? I asked him to sign this letter and he freely did. So you asked him to backdate it? Excuse me? You asked him to backdate it? You're claiming he signed it on the 22nd. Yes, and, uh, and uh, we said, or I said, and it's okay with him, uh, we'll put the date down of the 21st because that's when we talked about this. That's when we had our meeting. That's my recollection. So you asked him to back it? I suggested that, that this be the date that be put on there, and that's what we did. Had you sought counsel concerning this matter? Excuse me? Had you sought counsel? A legal counsel concerning this matter at the time you prepared this letter and or met with Ron Vasek in October? Uh, no, I'm keeping it confidential. Did you tell Vasek that you wanted Grundhouse to be able to be uh, able to work in Fargo? No. Did you know and understand that at the time you had um, first met with Ron Bosick and heard the allegation, and then had this second meeting in your private residence with him, and then had him sign this letter, that having heard the allegation that he made uh, about Grundhouse to you under canon law, you had a duty a requirement under the canon law to report this allegation? Objection has been answered. Notwithstanding what Ron Vasek wanted? Same objection. Uh, 
later, uh, I reviewed that later. At the time, uh, I was keeping his confidentiality strictly as he asked. Did you discuss uh, Ron Vasek? Uh, at that meeting, you said the meeting lasted four or five minutes. Forty-five. Forty-five. Okay. Oh, good. 45. Okay. That, okay. Um, in the forty-five-minute meeting, did, did, you, did Ron discuss with you and you with him the status of his son, who is a priest in the diocese, and what could or could not happen if he did or did not sign such a letter? Yeah, I think I think maybe we did uh, about uh, him himself being a deacon and people knowing if he did bring forth and uh, wanted to bring this forth as, as an accusation uh, that that uh, being assigned people would know that when he's assigned uh, and and two would know that his his son the priest. Uh, uh, works in the diocese, uh, yes, um, not to the extent that uh, he, he neither either of them, Father uh, Father Vasek or Deacon Vasek, uh, would not be assigned. They would be, but but it, it would people would know. I, I believe he asked that about that. Yes. Do you remember Ron Vasek expressing concern to you uh, about? The, if he didn't sign the letter that you had prepared um, for him to sign, that it could hurt the status of his son, who is a priest under your control of the diocese? Absolutely not. There was a discussion no. about Craig, wasn't there? Yes, but not in conjunction with you, uh, him signing this statement or not. Well, the whole no purpose action. of the meeting was to deal with the Grunhouse accusation. purpose of the meeting is to deal with the list of Fargo was putting together. And you wanted, and, 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 and the question was, is Grant House going to be able to be eligible for ministry or not, correct? No, not correct. And um, is it also correct to say that if Ron had not recanted and signed the letter prepared by you, uh, Grundhouse would remain I ineligible. Objection misstates his testimony. Correct. Incorrect. Grundhouse could not have been doing substitute ministry in Fargo, correct? Objection. Correct. Okay. But it didn't have anything to do with the letter or our conversation. Uh, Fargo was making that determination. But the only way Grundhouse could have been made eligible is if Ron Vasek recanted the allegation, which you had him do on uh, on October 21st or 2nd, correct? Objection, foundation, he cannot speak incorrect. for the Diocese of Fargo. So when did you learn that you as the bishop and the diocese was under court order to produce the name from the list of all the priests accused of sexual abuse of minors? I don't recall that. Uh, we had cases before. Uh, I know the judge uh, had, had said that. I don't recall when I first learned of that. And was that after or before October 21st? Uh, in 2015, uh, you met with Ron. Uh, I, I don't recall when I when I first learned that. Grunhouse's name was not produced on the list uh, given us under the court order uh, issued by Judge Marvin. Why not? Uh, at that time, there was no accusation brought forth. Uh, Mr. Vasek asked for confidentiality, and that was respected. And at the time that you were required to produce um, the names of the priests accused, which would have included Grunhouse, 
Um, did you have the judge's court order in mind when you met with Ron Vasek on October 21st? No. Not, not in your mind at all? No. Who, what lawyer was advising you about, uh, about Judge Marvin's order and what you had to do to comply with it? I don't recall. I, I, I learned of it, I believe, through our Vicar General who handles these things uh, about the list, you know, required to produce that list. Yeah. So you had no discussion with a lawyer about that? I would object to attorney client privilege. No, I, I didn't ask. So what I learned, lawyer, I what lawyer that, was advising, what lawyer was advising you about, about what you had to do under that order. Uh, again, I learned about the list through. Uh, well, don't tell me what you learned. General, Just tell me. And, do, hold on. I, I, uh, hold on. Hold on a second. Well, let him Bishop. give his answer. I, he's yeah. giving confidence. You know. I, I, you know. I, I, I'm asking who the lawyer is. My recollection is Susan Gardner was the first to go through our files. Just, just the name is all just he's asking. Give me. That's all. That's all I'm asking. Yep. Susan okay. Gardner. Okay. My recollection. And then who reviewed the files to determine what names would be produced under the court order? Susan Gardner, first, Mr. Braun, firm second. Why both of them? Because we were asked to do it. We asked you two different times? I believe so. So, Gertner the first time, Brown the second, is that it? Excuse me? Gertner the first time, Brown the second? Gardner, Susan Gardner is it the first? Gardner. And the Brown firm second. Okay. Yeah. So the first time, the initial order was, the review was done by Gertner? Correct. I'm going to show you Exhibit 15. And um, Bishop Exhibit 15 is uh, from you uh, to Jennifer Hasselberger, a former uh, chancellor in Kirkston, but now in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, responsive to uh, Grundhaus wanting to do work in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. And you are responding to an inquiry about Grundhaus's fitness, correct? Uh, yes. And uh, you represent to the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, that uh, Grundhaus is a person of good moral character and reputation, correct? Correct. And you represent that you know of nothing which would in any way limit or disqualify him from ministry, correct? From this ministry, yes. Wouldn't um, the accusation that he gave to you and made to you um, of Grundhaus having abused him as a teenager, he, he just a moment. Answer. Disqualify him from ministry? Please repeat the question. Wouldn't the accusation Ron, Ron. Bosick made to you, his lips to your ears, that Grundhouse had abused him as a teenager, disqualify him from ministry? Mr. Vasek asked for complete confidentiality and did not want to bring forward an accusation, and I respected that. When you also write, I know of nothing which would in any way limit or disqualify him from ministry, why does Ron Vasek's desire control your belief that you can misrepresent to the archdiocese 
uh, the true facts only you know to be. Objection, argumentative. Join. Uh, Mr. Vasek asked for com complete confidentiality, and therefore I kept it completely confidential what he told me uh, in 2011, and this is 2012. So I'm respecting that confidentiality. Is that the same reason a Grand House wasn't produced on the list? Uh, that was required to be ordered uh, to be produced by the diocese because of Ron Vasek's request that, to you? That was Fargo's decision to make that list. No, I'm talking about the court order that said produce the names of those who were accused of sexual abuse and the diocese did not produce the name of Grunhaus in that initial list. So the diocese of Crixton? Yes. The reason he was not on that list is because I'm respecting confidentiality, Mr. Vasek. Uh, in the same exhibit 15, you write uh, to the Archdiocese and Chancellor Hasselberger, I am unaware of anything in his background which would render him unsuitable to work with minor children. That's a lie, isn't it? Objection argumentative. You don't have to answer that. That's a lie, isn't it? Counsel, can you rephrase in a non-argumentative way? That's not the truth, is it? I'm respecting the confidentiality. Is that the truth, sir? I'm respecting the confidentiality. You represented to the archdiocese. I am unaware of anything in his background which would render him unsuitable to work with minor children. Was that true or false? I'm respecting the confidentiality. Sir? That's why it, I signed that. Is that true or is that false? I'm respecting the confidentiality. So you are using uh, a claim of Ron Vasek's confidentiality to protect not only Grunhaus, but uh, the Diocese of Crookston uh, from avoiding a scandal and public disclosure of what you knew Ron, uh, what Monsignor Grunhaus had done to Ron Vasek, correct? Objection, okay. argumentative. You don't have to answer that, Bishop. Join. Do you choose to answer that question? You do not have to answer that question. But you can if you choose. Council, let's move on. This is the same thing you did with Sullivan, isn't it? You don't have to answer that question, Bishop. You kept it quiet. You didn't tell anybody. And you used some excuse for trying to claim that nobody needs to know because you thought Sullivan was fit the same way you think Grunhaus is, correct? Objection, argumentative. Counsel, do you need a break? No. It's the same thing, isn't it? You don't have to answer that question, Bishop. Do you see the similarities, Bishop? Move on, Counsel. Do you see him? You don't have to answer this line of questioning, Bishop. I'm going to show you in a exhibit five. You want to show it? Or not? Okay. There was a statement, a release that you issued on September 27, 2017. Uh, is a press release. I'll just read from it. There's one statement in it that you made. I just want to ask you a question about it. Um, and uh, you write at that time, looking back and knowing what I do no now. I believe I would have handled my conversations with Mr. Vasek differently. What did, what did you mean when you wrote that and issued that press release to the public? Well, I 
might have tried to reassure him more uh, would be one thought that I have. Um, He talked about, in that first meeting, uh, forgiving Father Grunthaus. And uh, I would have encouraged him along those lines because I think that's good to do, that forgiveness. And I probably would have pushed more on the confidentiality. Uh, as I said later, reading the charter, uh, and with his approval, would have brought forth, uh, according to the charter, would have, would have helped him bring this forth. I offered it. Uh, he didn't want to do it. So along those lines. So you knew uh, and you learned under the charter, if you didn't know at the time, that actually, even if you wanted confidentiality, you were required to tell them that you were required to report? Is that what you would have done differently? I would have tried to help him uh, bring forth according to the charter, you know, bring it forward. Well, he, would, that. he was becoming a deacon, and you could have said to him, look, we have a charter that says that, Ron, I understand you want this private, and you shared it with me, but under the charter that I'm obliged uh, to follow, um, as the bishop of this diocese, where you're soon to become a deacon, uh, we're required to do more, and that is report this. Um, there's nothing that kept you from doing or saying that to him at the time, was there? No, I, I went. I explained the charter to him, but as I just said, I, I would have maybe moved, uh, kept on it a little more. That, that's kind of the thought that I was having there. In fact, under the charter, you're not only obliged to report under the charter, you report, you're required to, uh, to, uh, to do a report of a preliminary investigation. Which we did when it was public. Well, that preliminary investigation was, uh, was done and made public only because Ron Avasa came to us and we filed a suit, which was, which was public, correct? Yes? Mm -hmm. And yes? Yes. And then uh, a preliminary investigation was done, and that was done by Goodwin, right? Correct. And it was then for the first time that Grunhaus was confronted with the accusation that you knew Ron Avasa had made against him of sexual abuse, correct? To my understanding, that's when Grand Father Grundhaus found out what it was Mr. Vasek first, had said. It was the first time you or anybody else even asked Grundhaus about this as far as you knew. As far as I knew. After Ron brought suit. Because I was keeping it confidential, as he asked. Has the allegation that has been made now public um, been brought to the CDF? I believe so. By whom? First by Monsignor Baumgartner. And when? Uh, I believe shortly after uh, the press conference. I, I don't know the dates on that one in particular. Okay. And what action, if any, has been taken? Well, we've we did our preliminary investigation at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, moved it to the Congregation for Clergy. And uh, 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 Father Goodwin did a preliminary investigation and did a report that you had a copy of, correct? Correct, correct. <clears throat> and he found uh, that he believed that there was a delict, but there were some technical difficulties um, um, under canon law with finding a severe delict, correct? Well, first of all, uh, oh, do you recall that? Generally, yes. Okay. Jim Clausen's deposition has also been taken. He testified that Monsignor Grunhaus 
restrictions are going to be lifted by you. Have you indicated that uh, you intend to lift restrictions imposed on Grand House's ministry? I've given no indication of that. Are you going to? I have not decided on, on that. When are you going to decide? Uh, I'm waiting. Uh, following these proceedings, uh, I, I don't know what we're going to do with that. What do you point. want to do? I don't know what we're going to do with that. What do you want to do? You're the bishop. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. He's your friend, isn't he? Brenda. Uh, yeah, he's a friend. You don't want him to be under this restriction, do you? Doesn't have anything to do with, with it. I'm asking what you want. You don't want him to be under this restriction, do you? I have no want one way or another on that. Do you think this whole process um, is unfair to, 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 to Monsignor Grandhouse? No. Do you think you have treated Ron Vasek with the res respect he deserved? Absolutely. Aside from Baumgartner, uh, 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 your book, uh, aside from what you believe got Baumgartner did, did the diocese uh, send the case to the CDF? I uh, contacted the CDS, yeah, CDF, yes. How, how, by what means? When they received information from Father Baumgartner, they contacted me and I responded, yes. So it was actually Baumgartner on his own felt that the CDF had to know, and then the CDF contacted the diocese and said, hey, Baumgartner made a report here. What's the deal, right? Correct. Ask you some questions. Um, it's 11:30. I can finish by noon. So, you okay to keep going? Or you sure. want to take a break? Sure. Yep. Yeah. No. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask some questions about a priest, uh, Father Joseph Richards. Um, that's a file that has been uh, disclosed to us, which we've had the benefit of, of reviewing, and. Um, When in time, if at all, did you ever receive any information that Father Joseph Richards was either suspected of or reported to have been engaged in some inappropriate conduct with you? Uh, when the Braun folks reviewed our files just recently, uh, in my understanding, it's not Father Richards who was accused. Or, or there was concern, it's not about Father Richards. So how do you know Father Richards? Father Richards is a priest of the Diocese of Crookston. I came to know him when I came here. And he's a, he's a friend? He's a friend. show you an exhibit we've marked, Exhibit 3, uh, Bishop, and this has um, been produced in litigation here. It's three pages. This is a psychosocial history uh, pertaining to Reverend Joseph D. Richards, dated July 14, 1993. Uh, and It's correct first when it comes to Father Richards. He has been in ministry and was until 
2015, correct? Uh, he's still in ministry. Excuse me. He's still in ministry and was appointed in 2015? What is? He's been in ministry since the 80s, 90s. Still okay. In Excuse me. So let me just get the question right so I can give you an opportunity to get the answer that I, uh, I'm trying to uh, understand. Uh, <coughs> Father Richards has been continuously in ministry in the Diocese of the Christian, uh, both as far as you know prior to your installation as bishop and continuously while you have w um, worked as bishop for the last 11 years? Correct. In this report at the bottom of the second paragraph, it says he also experienced the death of his father in February 1992. In addition, he feels that he has problems with sexual compulsivity and considers himself to be sexually addicted. Did you read that? I see that. Mm -hmm. Did, when is the first time you saw that? Uh, right now. That's the same language that was used by St. John Vianney when they described Father um, Sullivan, isn't it? Oh, Sexual is compulsivity, is it? Um, Show you the second page of this report at the bottom of it under psychosexual history, second paragraph. It's, it states, Joseph said that he considers himself to be bisexual at this time, although he has never had sexual relations, he admits to feeling somewhat confused regarding his sexuality. He feels that his masturbation, need for pornography, and sexual fantasizing would become out of control whenever he would go out of town. When he began to have fantasies about abusing a child, and felt an attraction towards children, he decided to voluntarily seek help. Have you read this before? No. Does this, the reading of this and seeing this in a psychosexual evaluation done <coughs> cause you to re be willing to re-examine his assignment in ministry given this professional assessment and his self-report? Not at this time, no. Bishop, I'm going to ask you to take a look at this. This is serious. And if you haven't seen it before, I really think you need to act on this. And I'm just going to invite you to re-examine your position on this. If you hadn't seen it before, I understand how that works. But I do not understand. Um, that you wouldn't want to, and nor should you, would, uh, I do not understand that you wouldn't want to. Now, having read this, us having looked at this, us having now seen this. Is there a question, counsel? Uh, how you wouldn't want to do that. So are you willing thus to reconsider your position of Richard's status in ministry, given this information? I'll read this statement. I'm going to show you exhibit, in the same exhibit, uh, at the last page under impressions, the last sentence I'm going to read, it says, his fantasies regarding children while not uncommon for sexual abuse victims, are disturbing and should be treated as a cry for help. He would probably benefit from an intensive inpatient program. Have you read that before? No. Did you know that before now? No. Do you agree this needs to be visited? Mm -hmm. I, I'll read the statement. I'll show you Exhibit 29. Um, 
And this is a handwritten statement that's been produced. Um, and it states uh, on Wednesday, October 11th, uh, Joe Richards met with Bishop Balky and myself. Do you know what date this is? What year? Uh, we, we don't have a year. That it, it, it's, it's not, uh, we're not sure. Do you have a year? I, I don't no. know. It wasn't dated. I mean, October 11th was the date that we had on top of it. But yeah. We copied well, we know, we know when Bishop Balky was there, and so we can narrow it down to that. That's right now for, for today at least. Um, and he says, I met Bishop Balky and myself to uh, share that 16 or 17 years ago, he, Joe at the age of 15, sexually abused a five or six year old boy he was babysitting. Did you know that Father Joe Richards had admitted having done that? I believe Monsignor Foltz told me about this note when it came to light. Okay. Yeah. But he didn't tell you about the psychosexual report and the history I've of fantasy. I've seen that before. Do you think you should go back and ask Monsignor Foltz why he didn't tell you about the psychosexual history that re appears in the file of Richards that we now have possession of and referred to as exhibit? Whatever it is. I don't know. Okay. I'll ask him. Uh, we're, good. we're just about done. Uh, we got Bishop's notes. Let's use the restroom. I'll look at the notes yep. and then we'll reconvene and, and we'll finish up. Good. We are going off the record at 11.42 a.m. We are back on the record at 12.13 p.m. All right, during the break, um, we did have an opportunity to get uh, a copy of and review the notes pertaining to some of the meetings that you had uh, with Ron Vasek where you thought you had taken notes. Right. And it turns out, Mr. Braun, you had them and you gave them to us and we now reviewed them and came to the realization that they had not been produced. I, uh, I can't tell you that that is inadvertence. It is not, it is not an intentional thing. We know that we have uh, worked with you in your office long enough that stuff happens where we miss it. And that would, that would account for this. So there's no bad faith uh, and nothing like that. All it, all it requires then, Bishop, is us to just maybe go through the notes Good. that were made contemporaneous to those things that both can um, help you refresh your memory and get, give us an account of your best recollection. Okay. Good. So having said that, uh, let's start with. Uh, Here's a stack. Oh, okay. I'm going to show you first. Let's go through what these are. When you look at uh, the first one, it's marked Exhibit 42, and that's a typewritten. Um, the reflecting uh, notes of 913. 11 and 9 14 11 and then behind it is mark 42a which are your handwritten notes is that your handwritten yeah yep. okay so we'll put those right together because that's really one exhibit because and then the next one is exhibit 43 which would be the the transcription done of your handwritten notes uh which are marked 43a do you see that i got it okay <laughs> And then the third exhibit we'll review together is 44, which again is a transcription. And then we have uh, the handwriting uh, done by you of the, of, the, of the notes. Got it. OK. Thank you. So let's go through the three exhibits together. Um, starting with exhibit 42. Okay. Um, we had already asked you some questions this morning about the call you got from um, Monsignor Gearing. Your recollection was that Gearing had not told you 
uh, anything about a sexual abuse allegation against Grunhouse. We reviewed those notes, and I think uh, the notes show that, in fact, um, um, otherwise. So, why don't we just walk you through uh, what the what your handwritten notes say here? Okay. And I think probably you should look at your handwriting. Um, Tom, do you know was this transcription done by your office or his? It, it office? was done by uh, Bishop's secretary with Bishop's assistance in the event that there was any indecipherable writing. Okay, so to 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 walk through this as best we can, do you think we should use the typewritten one then? I think we could use the typewritten and then refer back to the hand if needed, because I think Bishop's confirmed that the typewritten is in fact an accurate transcription of the handwritten note. Okay, correct, Let's Bishop. Good. Let's let's use uh, Exhibit 42 then, just because you have a hand in the transcription. You're the best person to help us discern it, uh, given that it's your handwritten notes of events uh, some years ago. So referring you to the typewritten Exhibit 42, Bishop, why don't you just read what your notes say here? And because he writes this down, we try to talk more slowly because we talk faster when we read. Okay. Uh, this was a phone conversation with Monsignor Gary. Ron Basic said, this is Monsignor Gary telling me, I guess, huh? Mm -hmm. Ron Basic said when he was 16, he drove down to, down to Canon Law Convention with Monsignor Grinhouse, and Monsignor tried to fondle him when he was sitting on his bed in his underwear. He told him to stop. Uh, Monsignor talked to Ron five years ago uh, and asked his forgiveness and told him this was the only time that he ever did that. The note says if, Monsignor Gehring says if Ron told anyone, Monsignor said he would deny it. Ron is wondering if he is in fact the only one, but he's not looking for anything. He's concerned about repercussions, and then Monsignor gives me Ron's phone number. So uh, I'd stand corrected on, you asked me, did, did Monsignor Grinthouse get named in that conversation? The answer would be yes. So then when we go to um, September 14th, why don't you continue in the same pace? Okay. This uh, is my calling, Mr. Vasek. Do you want to talk about this? Uh, does he want to bring the matter up? I told him I received a call from Mr. Monsignor Gehring telling me about a conversation you, Ron, had with him regarding something some years ago about you and Monsignor Grinhouse. Do you recall? I'm calling as a follow-up. I would be happy to visit with you about this if you'd like to make an official complaint or an accusation. Father David Baumgartner would take that and that would begin our following the directives of the Charter and norms. And we set up an appointment for Monday at 9. The next paragraph, as you read that, I, I, I had a hard time discerning that. Are you are these notes to yourself? Or what, what, can, are you able I think to they are. I think, I think this is what I uh, 
set out in my notes, and then I called him. So, uh, would you like to speak about this? So I will call him, question mark, which I did. Would you like to speak about this? And at which I asked him. Uh, did you want Monsignor to call me, Monsignor Gary? Uh, because he did call me. Did you want him to? Did you want me to call you? And I did. Uh, you certainly could have called me yourself. These are just, and then I did it, go ahead and make the call. That is my record. So are those things that you actually expressed to Ron, or are these notes in your own head? I believe uh, the top part, not the questions down here, I believe the top part is the conversation that I had with him. And the bottom part is just more notes to yourself. Beforehand. That's my recollection. Got it. Uh, let's go then to 43. And um, 43A is your handwritten. Let's refer to 43 and ask you to uh, slowly uh, walk us through that. And if I need to or want to, I'll stop and perhaps ask questions if necessary. OK. How are we doing? So Ron came in. Uh, he told me he thought about what he was going to say for some 40 years. So this is like five days later now after the? The following Monday. OK. He comes in with some fear and trepidation, but no animosity. He says he's not looking for any monetary gain. Uh, he describes it's his story is that when he was in, in around the eighth grade, Monsignor was in his first assignment around 1968. When Ron was 16, he had just gotten his driver's license, he recalls. He asked, was asked to drive with Monsignor to Columbus, Ohio, Canon Law Society of America convention. Uh, he recalls he didn't have a lot of money. I don't remember exactly what that conversation was. They were going to get something to eat. So the first night, or second, the note says, as he was sitting on his bed watching TV, father touched his genitals. He, he said he backed away. He never said anything. He never said another thing about it. He didn't think about it. He likened it uh, like a brother would do, like something a brother would do. And the next year, he says he drove with Monsignor again to Peoria, Canon Law Society of America meeting. There was a blizzard, though, and they never made it to the convention. What had happened the year before never bothered him. Monsignor was the priest that married uh, himself and his wife, Pat. The relationship with Monsignor was good. He was there for his brother's funeral. Monsignor was good to the family. So what it says here, uh, when the abuse thing, the charter in 2000, started up, he wondered if Monsignor had done this to someone else. know what more and more him means. He, Ron had never told anybody, except Father Leffer. I don't know the spelling on that. And Monsignor uh, and himself. But Ron kept hearing more about sexual abuse of clergy of minors, and how shuffled under the rug. Then he names a, a priest, a former priest of the Crooks and Dices, Rick Boyd. He heard about him. He didn't know whether it was true, what he heard about him. Uh, it was on Catholic radio, uh, on 
the abuse issue and about grooming and wondered if he was groomed. So he kept thinking, and this was in the back of his mind, um, the thing with Monsignor. Huh? Uh, five years, uh, I, I think that refers back to the Columbus, Ohio reference. After five years, Monsignor Grenhouse talked to him and asked forgiveness, said what he'd done was inappropriate, he should not have done it, uh, that Monsignor had confessed it in the Sacrament of Reconciliation, but he asked Ron's forgiveness, said he needed Ron's forgiveness. This is what Ron said, Monsignor said, that what he had done was inappropriate, it shouldn't have been done. I, I've been repeating that. He'd done it in a weak moment, Again, Ron says, how did Ron know that this was the only one? Before it said, a week later bugging me? Yeah, I don't know what that is. A week okay. later. I don't know what the week later is. Does that mean that a week after he confessed it and asked for forgiveness, he started bugging him? Yeah, I don't know what that means. Okay. So there's a period after okay. So Monsignor said it was a weak moment, okay, period. I don't know what that's thing. Got it. Again, Ron, how does he know it's the only person? At one point, I think Ron said he came into Monsignor's office, and this would have been when Monsignor was the vicar general, huh? And asked him how he ended up being in charge of these things, I presume sexual abuse of minors. All uh, through process is what it says. None of that. Had to lie. Don't know what that means. But he'd like to know. Ron would like to know if there ever was anyone else. He can forgive Monsignor, but what about others? And Monsignor said, "It never happened again. I give you my word." Whatever came out, Monsignor again, Ron says, Monsignor said he would deny it. I wondered if he lied to me, Ron. And then, there, again, there's no others. Would he just deny it? So he asked again, I have to know, was I the only one? And Monsignor said yes. Again, Ron says, I looked at it as a brother-to-brother -brother thing, and it, so it didn't bother me. And he left it alone. I don't. Um, this next thing I think refers to father visiting their home. I don't. He used the restroom, the bathroom. I don't. I don't recall this. Something on a health supplement he saw in the bathroom says this really suppressed my sexual desire. I think that refers to what was on the, I don't know, on the supplement that he saw in the restroom, in the bathroom. Just going back a moment, I read this to say, uh, left it, then last spring father called me, call in house, notice the spray in the bathroom. You should come to a meeting health supplement said, quote, it has really suppressed my sexual desire, unquote. Is that? Yeah, that's what it says. And okay. I don't know exactly what that refers to. I don't remember. Then Ron said there was, a, they were visiting, or he was visiting with, he remembered. Then it says, and I don't know who said it, or Ron thought it, it just says, all those guys there, gay, period. Quote, I don't feel safe, period, end of quotes. And Ron says he remembers thinking Father Grindhouse went to Crozier too. Ron, uh, 
John again says, do you just want me to read that? Yes. It, it says, next is Father G. Grunhouse invited four guys to go to Crozier, dot, dot, visit it, period. So process it, period. Ron says, I didn't know if I should say anything again. He felt compelled, maybe for his sake, Monsignor Grunhouse, to get help. He get help, period. If he struggling with that issue, period. When he was 18, wondering, no problem, period. <coughs> Danger, question mark, no. Process, question mark, no. Complaint, question mark, no. You know, again, as I said in my testimony before, I invited Ron to bring this to the process, to make a complaint using the charter, uh, and he said no. Does, does Monsignor need help, question mark? Was he screwed up in Crozier, question mark? Did he get it fixed, question marks? How do you feel, question mark? How is that? So that was the 919. And uh, so the reading of that, when was the last time you had read or reviewed these notes? Oh, some time ago. I, I can't tell you. Did you do it recently in preparation for today? Uh, I maybe read last. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not look at these in preparation for today. All right. And then the third one. Is that the third one? Okay, now we're turning to Exhibit 44, and um, the date of this one is uh, October 21st, 2015. This is four years after the notes you've identified and read Exhibit 43 and 44, which is in the year 2011, so we're four years down the road here. And uh, so these are notes. Uh, what do these, what does Exhibit 44 reflect, Bishop? Um, this is uh, the day that Mr. Vasek came to my home. Okay. And I'm writing, uh, again, this process. There's Ron Vasek's phone numbers there at the top. And we go with Leffer, his father Leffer. This is just in my mind reviewing how this came about. Ron had talked, Ron Vasek had talked to Father Leffer, who talked to Father Gehring, who also talked to Father Vasek, uh, Mr. Vasek, about an Ohio meeting. Uh, and then they came to me, Bishop Hepner. If any okay filed, it says there. Ron did not want this to be public. I think I've mentioned that. Not be public. And then we discussed if Monsignor Grunhouse has an issue, as I mentioned how we left it, Ron would call him. <coughs> Do you want to make a formal accusation? Do you want to bring forth an accusation? No. So then my note, Ron Bosick does not want to make an accusation, period. If Father Grunhouse has an issue, feel free to call Ron Bosick. That's how we left that. On the left side, uh, again, a summary. Father, Mr. Basic went to Father Leffing for spiritual help and healing. Father Leffer said he talked, take it, talk, 
it to his chancellor, which he did, Father Gehring. Father Gehring made a report to Ohio and called Bishop Hepner. Bishop Hepner talked with Ron Bosick, who did not want to lodge an accusation. That's what the note says. So according to the notes you made, contemporaneous to the various meetings in 2011, and now um, most recently, Exhibit 44, 2015, it's very clear that Ron had reported this uh, to uh, some folks in Fargo, Father uh, Gearing, Father Leffler, uh, the Ohio Columbus Police have all, had all now uh, had this information reported to them. That's correct. And all of that had been done uh, by others before Ron meets with you on October 21st, 2015, correct? I, I don't know about the reporting to Ohio, whether indeed that was um, something Monsignor Gehring did uh, subsequent to 2011. I don't know when that, I don't know when that happened. Uh, well, Ohio is referred to here. This is 2015, yeah. so by then, certainly. Yeah, by then, certainly, yes. Okay. Um, so when we go back to uh, Exhibit 6, which is the letter you prepared for Ron's signature dated October 21, 2015. Do you have that before you? Got it somewhere here. Yeah. Here it is. No? Yes. Yeah. yeah. This one. Yes. Okay. Uh, exhibit 6 you have before you, you testified that um, that's Ron's signature, correct? Correct. And you testify that this document uh, has never been altered, that this is a copy of the original that you've prepared but has since been destroyed, correct? It's a copy Protection, of the state's testimony. I believe the electronic copy has been destroyed. The original copy uh, is still have. possession of, and Ron has inspected it. So the original was kept by you where? Correct, in a file. Okay. Um, and what else pertaining to this was in that file? Uh, there's the you're being sued statements that came from your office. Or, um, uh, I believe those are in that file. Uh, there's some correspondence with the Congregation for Doctor of the Faith, Congregation for Clergy. It's just the file uh, uh, of the Ron Bosick case. What is the CDF doing with the Bosick case? They gave it to the Congregation for Clergy. And uh, have you heard what they're doing and uh, or what activity there is, if any? Right. The last they wrote me uh, uh, wondered about the preliminary investigation. I reported to them. I sent them sent that all over to them and they acknowledged that uh, they received it and um, that I was the one to make the to ultimately make the determination on what to do with Monsignor Grinhouse. Who advised you that you were authorized to make a determination uh, that's from the CDF? canon law who for, for um, Congress for clergy. Uh, who by name? Cardinal Stella. S-T-E-L-L-A? I believe so. Is he um, at CDF? No, he's at Congregation for Clergy. Okay. So it went from CDF to Congregation for Clergy? Correct. Did they tell you why? Because canonically speaking, it's not a case of, of a minor, involving a minor. Because under the canon, the 1917 canon and the 1983 canon, um, it's not. Uh, it's not a crime against the minor if the if the youth is uh, uh, over the age of sixteen. Correct. Uh, 
17, 18? Uh, probably 16, yeah. 15, 16. Yeah. I'd have to go back to my law. Uh, yeah, I'd say 16. Okay. Where was this Exhibit 6, uh, this letter that Ron signed uh, and uh, dated uh, or backdated in your office, kept before we sued the diocese? Where was it kept by you? I believe in my desk. And uh, what else was kept with this letter pertaining to this matter, if anything? I, I took a manila folder and I started to put things in it. Uh, and as they came, I put things in it. Uh, uh, my notes were not in it originally uh, until uh, I produced copies. Huh? I, I, they were my, my notebook. Um, so just at the beginning, uh, since 2011, just the, the letter was in there. Now, um, Bishop, you had told me and us earlier that you took no action responsive to Ron's report to you and the account he gave to you because he asked you uh, to keep it private. Is that correct? Confidential. The fact is, you knew and your notes record that it was already not confidential that Father Leffler and um, Father Gehring already knew uh, what he had accused Grunthaus of. Correct? Correct. And you also um, learned, as I think your notes reflect, that Fargo, and I think it was Gary, and actually reported to the Ohio, um, Pol Columbus, Ohio Police Department, correct? Uh, sometime after, sometime around 2000, I don't know the date, but it was, it was then, yes, it was brought up. And so you knew that um, notwithstanding what you claim his request to you was that it was not only known by Leffler, Gary, but it was known by the police, correct? It was going to be known by the police, or yes, being reported. And then you testified that Exhibit 6 was prepared by you um, and the singular motivation was to respect his desire to keep it private. Is that what you say today? His desire for me to keep it confidential. But he had already told these people and that it all happened, and now you're having him recant. And he is, on this writing that you prepared, that you wrote, is recanting. Why didn't it just say, he abused me, but I want it private? Objection. The state's the evidence. Argumentative. Joy. The, the statement, as I understood it and understand it, is not recanting. It's saying, I don't want to bring forward an accusation. I do not make any, I have no desire to, nor do I make any accusation, freely. Well, you prepared that, so what does that mean to you when you type this up? Uh, for him to sign, what is it that you are saying that you had him sign? Here? that he asked me to keep it confidential and I invited him, if he wanted to bring it forward, that it's done through the Vicar General. And he's telling me he does not want to do that. So it's, it's as you wrote it, you didn't consider it a recantation? Absolutely not. Okay simply a request that it not be per further publicly disseminated? It's not my request. It was his request in writing. 
Why did why is this document uh, not saved, Exhibit Six, when your notes are saved? Uh, I did save this note. Um, you did not save it in your computer. You saved it separately. Correct. And where were the notes saved? In my notebook. And um, when were the notes first shared with anybody? When uh, the suit came, I believe. At some point in time, Ron Bosick's uh, progress in his diaconate uh, was, he was led to believe that he was on track and then Father Yango and um, I can't, was it? Shriner advised him that a decision had been made to delay, uh, a decision had been made by you to delay his diaconate for a year. Do you remember? Not that. Uh, why did you delay his diaconate? Okay. So, to be clear, uh, the last thing I spoke with Ron Vasek about ordination was in April uh, of 2017, the ordination happening in June, and I last told him uh, he's, he, I would ordain him. I never told him I would not ordain him. Uh, so what you just said is not correct. Um, in fact, his name is on the invitation that went out to the public. So. He's, it's incorrect that I never told him he would not be ordained. Was it delayed? Uh, I found out that he dropped out. Father Schreiner didn't tell me. Um, Mr. Vasek didn't tell me. He dropped out. There's a document somewhere that, sh that shows that it was delayed, and, and that came as a surprise to him for one year before he dropped out. Uh, what can you tell me about that, if that is the case? A letter from Father Ilango, the, the um, sponsoring pastor, uh, stating he's getting notice from parishioners that Mr. Vasek should not be ordained. So he writes me, and I meet with him, and he suggests to me. Okay, we got to stop right here for a moment because he's running out of tape. I'm sorry. Okay. We are yeah. going off the record at 12:49 p.m. Uh, Bishop, uh, a few more questions. Um, you had referred to Father Iyango, e and that he had sent a letter. I, sh I put before you um, Exhibit Seven. Is that the letter that Father Yango? prepared uh, and sent to you concerning Ron Vasek and the postponement of his diaconate? It is. Uh, Father Ilango, and I, you know we don't have a date on this, but uh, subsequent to meeting uh, with him about his letter, I met with Mr. Vasek uh, in April uh, before the deacon ordination was scheduled for June. And it was not my idea uh, that ordination be uh, delayed or deferred for a year. It was Father Ilango's suggestion. I uh, went through the matter with Mr. Vasek, uh, and in that April meeting, I told him I would ordain him. And subsequent to that, shortly after that, was the Saturday morning uh, ceremony for the people of that class uh, at the chapel, and he was included in that as a step coming to ordination. And only after that, sometime in May, uh, did I hear, not from Mr. Vasek, not from Ms. Father Schreiner, uh, that Mr. Vasek dropped out, chose not to be ordained. Well, <clears throat> look at the exhibit, the exhibit seven. It says, Dear Bishop Hepner from Dr. Ya from Father Iango, it says, as pastor of Sacred Heart, um, I write you concerning Ron Vasek, who is in diaconate formation. 
I spent a year and a half working with and getting to know Ron. I, as pastor, recommend that Ron's ordination to the diaconate be postponed and reviewed in a year. And you're the one that makes the decision, right? Correct. So um, this is an evidence of Ron withdrawing. This is evidence of you, through Father Yango, delaying his diaconate. Correct? No. Objection misstates the evidence. No. So um, is it your testimony that the diaconate uh, or the delay, if there is one, as evidenced by this, in Ron's diaconate, has nothing to do with the fact that he brought uh, an accusation against Father Grenhouse and a suit against the Diocese of Crookston for its um, um, handling the matter? Uh, to repeat, Father Ilango makes a suggestion. I visit with Mr. Vasek about it. The conclusion of that meeting, I told Mr. Vasek I would ordain him before any suit, before any other business. Uh, he, Mr. Vasek, on his own, after I told him I would ordain him, dropped out. Well, this says postponed a year. That's what the suggestion was that, that I did not take. What's the date of this letter? We do not have a date, but it was before April of 2017. Uh, that's when I met with Mr. Vasek. When do you claim that he dropped out? After that, uh, um, and there are plenty of people that can attest to that, uh, he dropped out. I believe he was telling people they, they had a ceremony uh, Saturday, and then in, I believe the timeline, then in May there was a retreat that they, the deacon candidates went on, and Mr. Vasek is telling people at that retreat that he isn't going to be ordained. And I hear about it afterwards. That's my recollection. So how long after this letter was sent by Father Yango, and the, you're the ultimate ordainer, correct? Correct. You have the authority to delay, postpone, or deny, correct? Correct. So uh, how long after this letter was sent by Father Yango with your authority um, and, and to you um, about the, the postponement of his diaconate, the letter did you learn that Ron was, uh, as you claim, um, pulling out? I can't remember the word. So number one, Father Lango did not write this letter at my bidding. You had that in there somewhere. He wrote it on his own. Uh, I met with Mr. Vasek in April. Um, May came, I believe, was the ordination. And only then did I hear, not from Mr. Vasek, not from Father Schreiner, but from other candidates uh, that Mr. Vasek had dropped out, that he was not going to be ordained. That's, that's what he was telling them. It was news to me. And you learned uh, that he had dropped out. Um, uh, that was after he brought the allegations forward and began to work no. with us or before? Before, I believe. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll read and sign. But before we go off the record, I just want to make something clear that uh, this is being taken under a protective order. Mr. Vosick has a website where he has published numerous documents and information related to this case. I trust that you'll communicate with him about the nature of the protective order and republishing documents stemming from this deposition. Yes. Thank you. We, um, I think, we'll have to share with him the information Understood. and a deposition, but we will also advise him that there is a protective order and this is not a deposition that he or we have authority to post. We will not post it and we will advise him not to post it. He will follow that advice. And I, and I knew that he would and that you would give him that advice, and I thank you for that, Council. Yeah. Okay. We are going off the record at 12.59 p.m.